Hi there, this is Math 6, Unit 2, Lesson 11, representing ratios with tables. So first of all, we're going to look at um, this first set of patterns here. And we have some blue squares and some green squares. And it wants us to look for a pattern in that figure. <clears throat> and so when you take a look at this, we have, um, first of all, we can see we have three green squares here and four blue squares there, right? That's our basic pattern that we see in this first picture. If we take this picture then and say, well, if it's a pattern, we know it's doing something again and again. What we notice is that I have, again, a row of three green, and I, had, I added another row of three green. And over here is my four blues, and I added an additional row of four blues. So essentially, each time, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm increasing the number of greens and blue by the same number each time. I'm adding another row of three, or adding another row of four. Let's see if that pattern holds true here. So here I have a row of three, a three, and I added another row of three. Here's my row of four and four, and I added another row of four. So we can imagine that if this was to continue into the next pattern, or the next you know figure in the pattern, I would end up with a row of four, a four, a four, and another row of four. And I probably have a row of three, and a three, and a three, and an additional row of three, right? and that would continue on for however many figures we decided to do. So looking at how many total tiles would be in the fourth figure and so on, we can see that first of all, we know that in this first group we have four plus, uh, three plus four, which is seven there. Here we have, you know, uh, essentially we have six green and we have eight blue, so that becomes uh, 14 total. Here we have nine and we have 12, which becomes a total of 21, right? In the fourth figure, we would have three, six, nine, 12. We'd end up with 12 green and we'd have four, eight, 12, 16 blue. So in terms of total tiles, we'd have 12 plus 16, which becomes 28 total tiles. Now, if we look at the total tiles and see what's happening here, what do we notice? We have 7, 14, 21, and 28. So while I could continue to be adding the greens and blues together and then find the total, what do you notice happening with the total? For figure 2, it's a multiplied by 2. For figure 3, I do 7 times 3. For figure 4, I'm doing 7 times 4. It's a pattern. So for the fifth figure, I could simply do 7 times 5 and recognize that there are going to be 35 total tiles. For the 10th figure, I could do 7 times 10 for a total of 70 tiles. So when you look at the figures, there are different ways of approaching it. I could look at it from just a visual standpoint of how many and we can count them up. I can notice that I have you know a certain number of one color and a certain number of another and add them up. Or we could look a little further and say, well, I could look at the total and decide is there a pattern happening and find that pattern and then use it to find the other answers there okay and so so far we've been playing with lots of ratios dealing with different figures like this so a drawn out version we've also then looked at uh, ratios in the next activity in the form of a double number line so let's take a look at that one today all right and it says Noah's recipe for one batch of sparkling orange juice uses four liters of orange juice and five liters of soda water all right, so here's our orange juice. Let's say that he uses four liters of orange juice and we have five liters of soda water. Water it says use the double number line to show how many liters of each ingredient to use for different sized batches of sparkling orange juice. Okay, so um, again, this is like repeated addition, multiplication facts, right? So for one batch, we know we had uh, four. For two batches, I could take my four and go four times two is eight. For three batches, four times three is 12. And I would just use my math facts here to continue 16, 20, 24, 28, 32, 36, 40. And I think we're okay there, right? Over here, I should have probably started with zero. I apologize, I should have had zero, zero to start with. That's okay. So, and then this one we're counting by five. So we'd go five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, and so on. Again, these are the batches here that we're making, like so. 
So if someone mixes 36 liters of orange juice and 45 liters of soda, how many batches? So we can take a look at our double number line and say, well, there's 36 orange juice and 45 soda. So the number of batches is going to be nine, right? Pretty straightforward on our double number line. This works out well, just like the figures when we're talking about some small numbers or small batches. But when we look at number three, what does it ask? If someone uses 400 liters of orange juice, how much soda water? Well, looking at my table here, or this double number line, I, I really don't want to continue this out to 400. That's going to be a lot of work, and my little spaces are not going to be equivalent. If I wanted to be accurate, you know, I'm, I'm just making it up at that point, right? So I can't get to 400. That's pretty far out there. And so there's a limitation with the double number lines. But we could recognize a couple things. We could recognize that when I'm at 40, I have 10 batches, right? So when 10 batches is going to be 40, the question is going to be, let's pretend here, this kind of, kind of squiggles onto there, I'm going to go to 400. So 4 times what number is going to get you to 400? You might recognize that as being 100, right? So we know this would be the 100 batches is what we're going to make there. And so if it's 100 for this number, I use my 5 for soda water and do 5 times 100 to end up with 5 hundred liters of soda water as well. So it does work out there because we're thinking, okay, four is my basic for one batch. Four times how many batches gets you to using 400 liters of that? So we found out that that's going to be 100, right? And so we went five times 100 equals 500. That works out pretty well, but again, that's not going to work with our double number line. I mean, it does, but it's hard to visually show that there. If I'm using 455 liters of soda water, so we're looking on the soda water side, that means we're thinking about five times how many batches would end up being 455 liters of soda water. So five times how many batches there? Well, five goes into 45 nine times, and five goes into five one times. So this means we're gonna be making 91 batches, right? So I take that 91 batches and I multiply by what I started with, which was four liters for one batch. So that's one batch, but I'm doing nine, 91, and I end up with 364 liters. Again, these I could show on a double number line, right? I could extend this out, I could write that out there, we could do it, but it just is not as convenient, is it? You reach a point where it's just hard to do. Multiplying by both by the same number is what I'm doing here, right? I'm multiplying both uh, items in my recipe by the same number to find the equivalent ratio. That's what I'm doing with the double number line. It's what I'm doing over here as well. But there are other ways of showing this here. Okay. The problem with it, like we said, is a number five. What's the trouble with it is that it's too long of a number line, right? You can't fit everything on there. And sometimes the numbers are just too big, right? They're too large to really work with, with that double number line concept. So to help us do it a little bit easier, we can use what is referred to as a table. So we're gonna be talking about the same thing we've been talking about, but now we're gonna put it all in the context of a table. And this is a table right here. And if you remember, a table always has kind of some labels on the top of what it is um, representing, right? So we have almonds and we have raisins. Up top here are our columns. These are our columns. We have a column of almonds, column of raisins, and the numbers here represent different amounts of raisins and almonds here. And of course we have, with a table, we have our rows that go all the way down. So representing a different um, set of numbers, okay? So these numbers go together because they're in a row, but where they belong is they belong in the column with the almonds or the column of the raisins. So it wants us to complete the table so that the ratio is represented by each row equivalent. And basically what we're doing is we're taking a double number line and instead of having a double number line go like this with almonds and raisins and writing a seven and writing a five, we're taking that and we're rotating it around essentially to make a column or a table like this. All right, so let's go ahead and work on some equivalent ratios here, okay? What I did on the double number line is I would multiply by a number to get to something like 28, right? So to go from seven to 28, I knew I was multiplying by four. And so here I'd multiply five by four to end up with the number on the double number line being 20. 
I would draw it this way on a call on a table. I would say to go from there to there is multiplying by four, which means to go from five to the empty space, I would also multiply by four. So five times four is 20. Okay, we're good with that so far. Now, knowing that five times four is 20, I can look here and say, well, how do they go five to 10? Well, five to 10 is multiplying five times two. And that's okay. So if I do that here, if I do, do seven times two, seven times two is 14. Now, one difference you're already noticing is these numbers aren't in the same order that a double number line pattern would be, are they, right? It's not going the right way. This is not in an order, five, 20, 10. That's okay. That's actually what makes a, a table a little bit easier to use. You don't have to worry about the order uh, you find information in. It's about doing the right steps and the right process along the way. So when we look here at 3.5, that's another one, right? We have a blank here. How would you go from seven to 3.5? You might recognize that seven times a half, right? Seven divided by two is 3.5. And we could do the same thing here. So what is five times a half? It's half of five. It's gonna be 2.5. Okay, kind of neat there. All right, now what's cool about this is because they are equivalent ratios, you can actually use any one of the rows you want to help you find missing information in the other rows, which is very convenient when you get to something like 250. I can say 250 and recognize that, well, five times 50 five times 50 is 250. I could also go, well, uh, I could also look at a 10 and say 10 times 25 is 250. And so I could do different numbers to kind of figure out which uh, multi multiplier do I want to use. Let's just go ahead and do use the five times 50, okay? So that would mean I would do seven times 50 here and seven times 50 is 350, okay? And for the last one, we have 56, and I know that seven times what? Seven times eight can get me to 56, and what is five times eight? Five times eight is 40, and we fill it in there. So in terms of the method we use to fill this table, we were multiplying, multiply, the pairs of numbers by the same number. And sometimes that number was a whole number, like two and four, right, and eight. And sometimes we use even a, a fraction number. Sometimes we did a half, that's okay as well. We can multiply by all types of numbers depending upon if we're trying to make it larger or smaller. So how do we know that each row shows a ratio that is equivalent to seven to five? The reason we know that they're equivalent is because we're multiplying both parts of a ratio by the same non-zero number. That always creates a ratio that is equivalent to the original ratio. So because we're multiplying both pairs by the same non-zero number, times four right there, times two right here, times a half, times five, times eight, because we're multiplying both pairs of numbers by the same non-zero number, it always creates an equivalent ratio to the original. Okay, so that's the idea right there. So let's look at the summary for today's lesson. It says here that a table is a way to organize information. And it absolutely is right. It's a great way to organize information. We have our columns and things like that. And we can see here an example of a double number line where we have two dollars for three mangoes, four dollars for six, and we can take that double number line and we can convert that into a table with columns and rows that show the same information. Here is two dollars for three mangoes, here is two dollars for three mangoes. Just like visually we could draw a picture and say here's two dollars and here's a mango and a mango and a mango. And we can draw a picture and we can say that is my rate, that's my first ratio here, two to three, that we're talking about. I could draw this picture again and again, right? And I could add onto that there, and we would have the same idea, but now in picture form, right? I say, oh look, now it's four and six. There's four and six there, and there's four and six there. 
So these are three different ways of showing ratios and also being able to show what equivalent ratios look like and how you show that they are equivalent. Either in a picture form here with a graphic, a double number line, or what we're talking about in today's lesson and in the lessons ahead, using a column because it's a, just a different way of organizing it and we can do things a little bit more simply with or simplistically with a uh, table. All right, that's it for today's lesson. Pause there and you can start your homework and we'll see you in just a minute. All right, here's our homework for lesson 11. It says complete the table to show the amounts of yellow and red paint needed for different sized batches of the same shade of orange paint. And explain how you know. So there's nothing given here besides what it takes to make one batch right here. That's one batch. If I wanted to make two batches of paint, I would then double it, right? So five times two, right? Times two becomes 10. And six times two, if this is a times two here, becomes 12. Okay, that works out great. If I wanted to maybe make four times as much, I could do six times four, right? And six times four is 24. I could do five times four, and we're at 20. And while I could do whole numbers, I could actually even make less. Let's decide I wanted to make less than, um, you know, a whole thing. Maybe I wanted less, I didn't need that much paint. I could multiply everything by even, I could do multiply by a half, couldn't I? So six times a half is six over two, which reduces down to three over one, which is the same as three. And to do on this side, I would do five times a half, which becomes five over two, which I could rewrite as a mixed number and make that two and a half. So if I wanted to make a smaller batch, half a batch instead of a full batch, I could even multiply by a decimal number. And the reason I'm gonna know that those are gonna be equivalent and be the same shade is because I'm multiplying both numbers, pairs of numbers, by the same number, therefore, thereby creating an equivalent ratio. So make sure you write down your explanation. Number two, a car travels at a constant speed as shown on the double number line. So one hour, they go 70 kilometers, two hours, 140, three hours, 210. How far does a car travel in 14 hours? So how far does it go in 14 hours? Okay, so on a double number line, we can look and say, well, I'm gonna be going out here all the way to 14. At some point here, I get to 14. The question is here, how far is that in terms of the 14? Let's do a quick thing here. I'm gonna show you as a table real quick, all right? So if I had my time, right, and I had my distance, right here. What we have in our table is you know that in one hour we go 70 kilometers like that, right? We know that in two hours we go 140 and we know that in three hours we go 210 and the question is how far am I going in 14 hours? So notice with, with a table the way this works. I'm looking at the number one and deciding what do I, what's my multiplier to go from one to 14? that's going to be multiplying by 14. So to go to 70 to this blank, this space, I would multiply 70 by 14. So here's 14, here's 70. I put a zero to start with. Seven times four is 28, two. Seven times one is seven plus two is 980. So how far would this car go in 14 hours? It would go 980 kilometers. All right, so it's the same idea as saying, how do I go from one to 14? It's times 14 and 70 times 14 there. I just wanted to show you with a table, it's the same idea, just done in a vertical manner. All right, number three, the olive trees in the orchard produce 3,000 pounds of olives a year. It takes 20 pounds, here's 20 pounds of olives to get three liters of oil. So how many liters of oil does, it does the orchard produce all year? So we're looking for that number right there. We know it makes 3,000, so out of the 3,000, how many liters of oil will it make? So to start with, I know that I can get 20 pounds of olives makes three liters of oil. Notice they gave you 100 here. They do that so that we can go from one row of a table to another. I can go from 20 to 100 by doing what? I can multiply by five. And so I do three, times five, three times five is 
15. Now that's a nice number to work with, not the 15, but the 100 is because I can also go from 100 to 3,000 by multiplying by what? 30, okay? And that's what makes the table great. I don't have to worry about the 20 anymore because all the rows are equivalent. So whatever I do from this row to that row, I have to do from this row to that row. So if we do 30 times 15, we have 0, 15, 0, 0, and a 3, and we end up with 450 liters of oil is what I make. So sometimes it's helpful in a table to create a kind of an in-between number that you can use for finding out what you want to know. All right, let's turn the page and look at the next one. Number four. At a school recess, there needs to be a ratio of two adults for every 24 children on the playground. The double number line represents the number of adults and children on the playground at recess. So here's two adults for 24 kids. All right. So teachers, if you're wondering what that means, it means everybody is on recess duty today, plus family and friends are going to have to come out and help you because otherwise you're outnumbered. Sorry about that. Label each remaining tick mark with its value. So we have two, we're gonna be counting by two. So two, four, six, and eight, which means that here, if we take 24, we double that out, we get 48. If we add another 24 to that, then we're gonna be at 72. And so by using repeated addition, we can fill those in there, not a problem, okay? So how many children, uh, adults are needed if there are 72 children? We can look here and say, if I have 72 kids, then I need six adults and it's circled there just like so, right? All right, that's the idea. Number five, while playing basketball, Jada's heart rate goes up 160 beats per minute. Okay, so here's Jada. Jada has 160 beats in every one minute. Got it. While jogging, her heart beats 25 times in 10 seconds. Okay, so 25 times in 10 seconds. Assuming a heart beats at a constant rate while jogging, which has a higher heart rate? Well, I can't compare right away because I'm dealing with beats, beats, minutes, second. There's a difference here in minutes and seconds. I can't compare until I have those terms on the bottom be the same. So how many seconds are there in one minute? If you said 60, you're on the right track, which means that if I multiply this by 60, I would end up with one minute, right? I could say 60 seconds here. So to make this an equivalent fraction, equivalent ratio, if I multiply top and bottom by six, 25 times six is 150. Now 150 seconds is the same as 150 beats in one minute. Why? Because 60 seconds and one minute are the same thing. So now I can compare 160 beats in a minute compared to 150 beats in a minute. Which one has the higher heart rate? That would be the first one, the basketball. 160 beats in one minute is higher than 150. So a little bit of conversion there you had to do to change seconds into minutes in order to get what you needed to compare. All right, and number six, our last one for the day. A shopper bought the following items at the farmer's market. Six ears of corn for $1.80. What was the cost per ear? So we're looking for the cost for one is what we're looking for there. So right now we know the cost here started with a dollar eighty for six. So we have a dollar eighty for six. So in order to find out how much for one, I'm thinking of it this way. I'm thinking I want to go from six to one. So to go from six to one, I multiply by the reciprocal of times one six or divide by six. So a dollar eighty. Here's a dollar eighty divided by six, my decimal point up right away, six goes into one zero times, six goes into 18 three times, and we can see that I'm gonna have 30 cents is how much it will cost me for a one. Same idea for this one, we have, we want the cost per apple, so the cost per apple. So we're looking at, right now we have $2.88 for 12, and I wanna find out how much for one. So I'm gonna take my $2.88, and we're gonna divide it by 12. Okay, one second while I let my cat out of the room. There you go. All right, sorry about that. 
Someone let the kitty cat in the room. All right, 12 go put a decimal point up top. 12 goes into two zero times, goes in 28 two times for 24. We subtract, we have four left there. We have bring down the eight. 12 goes into 48, a whole four times. So we have 24 cents is what it costs per apple. And our last one of the day becomes, we start with the cost per tomato, cost per tomato. We have $3.10 for five tomatoes. So again, we're gonna divide that and say $3.10. Five goes into three zero times. It goes into 31 six times. We subtract, we have one left, and we have 62 cents. So we're gonna say 62 cents for one. So those become my answers. 30 cents for corn, 24 cents for the apple, and 62 cents for the tomato. That's it, have a great day, and we'll see you next time.